Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Lederman, and I am the coordinator for the CG's Global Policy Forum here in Ottawa. First, I would like to recognize the presence of members of the Diplomatic Corps. The Ambassador of Guatemala, Her Excellency Rita Claveri Scioli, uh, the Ambassador of Peru, His Excellency Jose Antonio Bellini, the Ambassador of Brazil, His Excellency Pedro Fernando Bretas Bastos, the Ambassador of Armenia, His Excellency Armin Yeganian, uh, the Ambassador of Slovenia, His Excellency Mar Marjan Sensen, uh, the Ambassador of Bulgaria, His Excellency Nikolai Milkov, the Ambassador of Germany, His Excellency Werner Wendt, the Ambassador of Albania, Her Excellency Elide Petoshati, the Ambassador of Turkey, His Excellency Selcuk Unal, uh, and the Ambassador of Georgia, His Excellency Alexander Lastsabitse. I, if they came in late, I don't know if I missed, ah, of course. And uh, last but not least for the moment, the Ambassador of Serbia, His Excellency Mihailo Papazoglu. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would also like to welcome diplomatic representatives of the embassies of Colombia, Slovak Republic, Spain, Haiti, Italy, and Romania, and Russia. We also welcome former Canadian heads of mission, uh, the former ambassador to the OAS Chile and Costa Rica, Paul Durand, uh, former ambassador to uh, Venezuela and the OAS, Alan Cullum, and the former ambassador to Finland, Craig McDonald, former ambassador to Venezuela, John Graham, and the former consul general in Los Angeles, Colin Robertson, and a special welcome to the newly arrived, or to the arrival here of uh, the ambassador of Chile, his Excellency Alf Alfonso Silva. And uh, we're also pleased to welcome representatives of the private sector, the Canadian government and agencies, Parliament, the University of Ottawa, and Carleton University. It's now my pleasure to ask Dr. Fen Hampson, Chancellor's Professor at Carleton University, Distinguished Fellow and Director of Global Security and Politics at CG, Co-Director of the Global Commission on Internet Governance, to introduce our speaker. Fen. Thanks very much, Larry, and uh, a warm welcome to uh, all of you on behalf of my uh, CG colleagues. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to uh, introduce uh, General Thomas J. Lawson, uh, who is going to speak to you. He's had a very distinguished career, a graduate of the Royal Military College of Canada uh, with a degree in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, when he graduated from RMC, he was posted uh, to Baden, Germany, where he flew the CF-104 Starfighter and those of you who know that plane know that if anybody can fly a starfighter and live to tell the tale, they can fly just about anything. Um, uh, following a, a four-year tour there, uh, he returned uh, to RMC uh, where he got his master's degree. Uh, he was uh, promoted to major in 1988, uh, posted uh, to Montgomery, uh, Alabama with the uh, uh, and attended the uh, United States Air Force Staff College, uh, where he got yet another degree, uh, a master's degree in uh, public administration uh, at Auburn University. Uh, he's held uh, postings in uh, Cold Lake, uh, Alberta. Um, he, in 1996, uh, he returned to Ottawa, uh, where he was uh, promoted uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and then uh, in... Uh, uh, 2003, uh, he held uh, a number of different staff positions with the Air Force uh, before joining the CAF uh, transformation team in 2005, where he led the stand-up of the Strategic Joint Staff Organization. Um, in 2009, uh, General Lawson was promoted to Major General and appointed Assistant Chief of the Air Staff in 2011, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General and posted uh, to the uh, Peterson Air Base in Colorado, where uh, he was uh, uh, 
uh, took on responsibility as a deputy commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command. Uh, General Lawson uh, was promoted to his current rank and formally appointed uh, to the Canadian Forces Chief of Defense Staff on October 29, 2012, a post he has served uh, with great distinction since then. Uh, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to General Tom Lawson. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that, Fen. And uh, Fen and I were just together in, uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogues in uh, Singapore. Uh, of course, all of you who have traveled in Asia will know that you don't sleep for the first couple of days, so you're the first ones at the gym, uh, probably about 4.30 in the morning. So as I struggled down there to, to climb onto one piece of gear, there was already someone there. And it was Fen on the bicycle reading a book at the same time. And let me tell you, at 4.15 in the morning, his hair is exactly as coiffed as you see it right now. Uh, pleasure. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> and thank you so much. There are very few of you. I, uh, I've gotten to shake the hands with most of you and very few of you for the first time. So uh, I really am very honored uh, by your presence here today. Uh, and especially with such an obscure title today as CDS Reflections. Uh, what will he be speaking about? And yet you came, and I thank you for that. And uh, uh, friends from the Diplomatic Corps uh, and, uh, and Defense Attaches, uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you on the ice uh, in a little while. Uh, we have a great, uh, a great tradition between the general and flag officers here in Ottawa and the defense attaches. Uh, we don't get to play a lot of hockey, and of course they've never played hockey, uh, so we uh, normally like to get together and, uh, and show what it's like to be Canadian. And they practice, uh, uh, by, the, by the time we have our last game in the spring, they often come very close to us. Never beaten us yet, I don't think. Would that be right? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to, to thank CG for putting on this event. Um, you know, I'm, I've been in for 40 years, and I, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, Canadians don't have a love-hate relationship with their military, but I think you would be able to safely say that they do have a love-don't-care relationship. Uh, and in the 40 years I've been in, I've seen that cycle up and down. Uh, and typically, uh, certainly when I got in in 1975, we were deeply into a don't care cycle. Now, I loved being in the forces. I loved flying the CF-104 Starfighter. Uh, everything seemed great at the time. But comparing it to where we are today, 2015, and, and we've been in this area, uh, and I'll explain what area I'm talking about, for the last 10 or 15 years, we're in a place that is unfamiliar to those who have been in uh, for 15 or 20 years. And that's, that's a place where Canadians recognize their men and women in uniform uh, in ways that we've never been used to being recognized before. In fact, the profession, the military profession, is now the most trusted profession in Canada. It's got uh, the approval rating of 89% of Canadians, ice cream somewhere around 85 uh, you you, you kind of work your way down. Uh, medical profession is in uh, the mid '80s, uh, right down through used car salesmen, lawyers, and and uh, along the way, uh, and and we aren't really used to that. And we've been trying to figure out how to bottle that. And I think it really does tie to people, certainly through the Afghan uh, Afghanistan uh, conflict, being aware of their men and women uh, in arms being in harm's way. But we really haven't been there for the last four years. So what explains this continuing rise in popularity? And I really put it through in a large way to groups like CG who bring the thinkers of our society, the opinion leaders of our society together to discuss many issues uh, of political value, uh, but also defense and security value. And, you know, far be it from me to ever take issues or odds with a uh, uh, an opinion put forward by the great thinkers at CG, uh, whether I would or not doesn't matter. The fact is that when a thoughtful and cogent uh, point of view is put forward, we all benefit from it, all of us. We benefit from the uh, debate that it generates and, uh, and the thought that Canadians can now put into things like defense and security. So thank you, I'll start with that uh, uh, for this opportunity. 
I, I would like to recognize uh, um, the presence of, uh, of a great friend from high school, a fellow named Fred Kuntz sitting up front here. Fred, could you stand up so they see who I'm talking about? This is the Vice President for Public Affairs, not going to stand up, uh, for uh, CG. Uh, I, full disclosure, uh, Fred and I were buddies in, uh, probably for the first time, 1971, 1972, hanging around uh, Kipling Collegiate. I know you all know Kipling Collegiate in Etobicoke. Uh, there, there actually is a nodding head here. Uh, it, uh, it, it, we're right in the same little area that, uh, um, that uh, both the Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, is from. I think he was Richview Collegiate. Fred, Rob Ford also is from that area. We'll move on. Uh, but uh, as we were there, Fred actually was uh, not only a great friend, but was our uh, valedictorian. And you know, this being a CDS reflection uh, opportunity, those linkages, those remarkable linkages, as, as I've watched him in his career, and he surprised nobody by having a fantastic career, they become more important to you because those ties kind of wrap through friendships. And, uh, and then I look at, uh, at some of those through the, my military career, and I, I recognize I would never have called uh, uh, our family, the Lawson family, military, and yet both of my grandfathers were in the military during the First World War. Uh, one of them had the misfortune to uh, spend two years in the trenches uh, of uh, Northern Europe. Uh, and my other grandfather on my mother's side was a pilot flying SOP with camels just towards the end of the war, saw no combat, uh, but uh, this leads to the next generation. My father was a fighter pilot flying Spitfires and Mustangs in the Second World War, um, and I wish I can remember so oft, so frequently when my grandfather, my surviving grandfather, who flew during the First World War, would sit down and visits and talk to my father about flying, and of course, uh, being the senior, he would speak about flying a SOP with camp. I can remember that they were talking. I was seven or eight years old. Last thing I wanted to do was sit and listen to two old boring guys. So I would leave the room and I thought, if only I had a listened to my father, my grandfather talking, I would now seize on those stories. But I didn't. Uh, years later, six or seven years later, I did become interested. My own father was very reflective about his role in the war. Uh, he told many stories about flying Spitfires and Mustangs. He always seemed to be the butt of his own jokes. His stories were, you know, anything but heroic. They were terrifying, of course. Many of them were sad. He lost all kinds of friends, but most of them were exciting, and they always slept in a warm bed. That certainly sounded good, and, and, and there was a little bit of alcohol in, involved, and, and he had great friendships. And I think, really, his experience, if there was such a thing as a good war, uh, if consuming, and certainly it was in his thoughts constantly uh, beyond the age of 85, my, my children will tell us all that, um, these stories became a driver in my own life, whether I recognized it or not. Uh, and he was a very gentle father. He never pushed anything on me. So one day as uh, we were approaching grade 13, when we had grade 13, my father threw me, anybody remember the Toronto Telegram? It had a... Uh, a Saturday magazine feature, and inside about page four, there was a, uh, an advertisement for the Royal Military College, and he said, what do you think about that? And I picked it up, and I said, uh, what, Gregory Clark's story? He said, no, the advertisement there. He said, Royal Military College. He said, you can try it out for a year, and then, uh, and then quit if you like. And my father never really tried to lead me anywhere, so the least I can do for him is give a year at uh, Royal Military College and then return back to Toronto with my buddies and go to the more traditional uh, opportunities like Arendelle or U of T or, or wherever we were going to go. Of course, what he might have known and what I quickly found out is, is this profession is kind of captivating. You know, when we, we take great young men and women into the military, and many of, them, many of them come in with an idea of testing things out, but once you get there and you go through the very challenges that, uh, uh, that raise you to places that you may or may not have had the opportunity to get to earlier in your career, it's tough to let it go. So my plan of quitting after first year at the Royal Military College, of course, quickly went away. How could I give up my friends in... Uh, uh, in this wonderful college, uh, so stuck around for four years, uh, and have been looking for an opportunity to leave ever since. Uh, and I think I finally found one, uh, and it's going to happen in a few weeks. But along the way, these 40 years are remarkable. Um, uh, and now two of my own boys are uh, air crew in the Air Force. Very proud of them. The third one is right here with Shopify in town. He defined himself by anything but the military, and God bless him. Two of them are flying, and that. I think, I'll put a marker on the table, 
Uh, I think that makes me, well, it certainly makes me the only Canadian with four generations of RCAF. And, and, and so there's a challenge out there. If there's anyone in the room or you know anyone, I'd love to meet someone else, but, uh, but that will be my point of pride for this evening. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, people join the Canadian Armed Forces to be involved in action. We recognize that. When your sons and daughters put on a uniform, they don't come in to make sure that their mental health is looked after. Uh, they don't come in with an idea that there's a pension at the end. They come in with an idea of being challenged, maybe defending Canada and Canadians if you've instilled in them that sort of uh, thought, a strategic sort of thought, but really largely they're looking for action. And I think that we're very successful in quickly introducing our men and women in uniform to challenges that bring them Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, or special operations to an area of expertise which challenges levels of expertise in any armed forces in the world. And I know many are represented here in the room. We have fantastic friends who we work with in many uh, arenas uh, around the world. Uh, we will never work as Canadians alone in uniform, except in our own country here, uh, dealing with uh, either Mother Nature or man-made uh, crises. It's the only place that we'll operate alone. Uh, but when we go international, we recognize that Canadians in uniform demonstrate a level of operational excellence uh, that is unbroken. And I think that feeds into this popularity level that we see with Canadians. They know not only they can depend on Canadian men and women in uniform here in Canada, and we saw that most recently uh, in the Calgary floods a couple of years ago, Winnipeg again last year, but you know that I'm not sure if any of you were in Calgary when those floods came through a couple of years ago. Our uh, commanders in Edmonton saw that coming saw the snow melting far too quickly, contacted our connections in, uh, in Calgary and said, look, we think you're going to be hit fairly hard here. We want to have our troops ready to help you sand uh, at the ready sandbags. Uh, are, are you interested in that? We'd like to deploy probably several thousand troops to the outskirts of Calgary and see what happens. Of course, politicians and, and those looking at, they don't want to uh, spook the herd there, so not, not really. Why don't you just maintain a readiness back in your barracks? Well, our barracks are in Edmonton. Tell you what, could we declare a no-notice exercise and be on the roads uh, in case this thing comes? Uh, the Calgary politicians and, uh, uh, and uh, peacekeepers, uh, police forces said, sure, use the back roads. So our men and women and, uh, and uh, reservists were set and ready when that wall of water hit through uh, Calgary. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the first couple of nights, that was like a war zone. We were, that water hit so quickly, rose 12 feet in a, in a matter of a couple of hours. And that night, uh, we had helicopters lifting families and pets off their roofs that they had scurried to with only feet of roof left. We had Hercules aircraft circling above that, dropping parachute flares, lighting the night sky, plucking them off, dropping them uh, onto a turf nearby. Uh, any, if, if you had seen combat in Afghanistan, this would be the closest thing to it. It was remarkable. And what we saw was Calgarians were so appreciative um, that, uh, of course, uh, like any self-respecting CDS, I showed up after all the action was done and accepted all the kudos uh, from the uh, Calgarian and Albertan uh, politicians uh, and, uh, and was delighted to, to do so. But I, I think that's what Canadians have come to expect from their men and women in uniform. As you well know, there are people active into their 60s and 70s in this room, climbing mountains and paddling rivers of Canada uh, when, uh, when many of you would be now at an age that in our grandparents' era, we might have entered into homes or become much more static. Well, it's our search and rescue troops who are going to be there when you hit your uh, $200 personal locator beacon when you flip into the white water or uh, slide off whatever iceberg you're in. Uh, we'll be there, and Canadians know that too. But it's not just that. C uh, governments of different colors uh, in the last 15 years have seen fit uh, to put Canadian men and women in uniform into harm's way uh, in, in defense of Canadian interests overseas. 
We've seen it frequently, and, and of course you see it right now. Uh, we have 69 troops up uh, helping the Kurds. Uh, you've read about them in the paper. Uh, the Kurds are doing extremely well up there in retaking and holding territory against this awful, this heinous threat known as uh, ISIS. Uh, and we've got aircraft based out of uh, Kuwait flying regularly, blunting the attack of ISIS. Certainly, they will not, through air power, end this conflict. There was never an idea that it would. But what they've done is they've blunted uh, the, the coalescence, the ability for ISIS to convene easily uh, and, and drive through uh, inflicting tragic damage on so many victims. We see that for the large part ceasing, 35% of the land that ISIS took in Iraq has now been reversed. There is much conflict left to come in that. But there you see Canadians playing a, a significant and weighty role in this 26-nation coalition. A little bit closer to NATO, where we've been a part of for 50-some years uh, in Eastern Europe, who would have predicted a year and a half ago that, uh, uh, that Russia would have taken some of the steps that they took. Friends owned office space within NATO and now seeing fit to take some of the activities that they have in there. And there's Canada out front uh, with Baltic Air policing ships uh, as required to help the standing NATO maritime groups uh, and uh, companies of uh, soldiers. Um, not in any way trying to be provocative to who we know will once again be our Russian friends, given some period of time between now and then. We're absolutely certain of that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the converse uh, leads us to places nobody wants to go. Uh, and I know an, our, our Russian friend in here tonight would agree with me on that. But there we have uh, uh, Canadian uh, men and women uh, uh, holding up the Canadian flag alongside our NATO partners in a very real and tangible way. Uh, we've seen um, a group of, uh, three groups in fact, of Canadian healthcare workers uh, supporting our British allies uh, in, on an Operation Serona against Ebola in Sierra Leone. Uh, there was something that very quickly could have spun out of control uh, and we saw an international response uh, that I think uh, investigation will show had a very real effect. So what we see is our readiness, the, the requirement for me, for my senior leaders, for our chief petty officers, for our chief warrant officers to ensure that our young men and women in arms are ready, prepared with the platforms they've got to provide opportunities for our prime minister, for our government to involve, not only here in Canada, which is non-discretionary, but to involve Canadian troops in very constructive ways around the world. Now, I will say, this is a policy group, uh, and I know all of you have been working in policy for um, uh, much, a uh, good part of your lives. Uh, I haven't. I've gotten into policy a little more deeply in recent years. Uh, but I think one thing we can agree on, and just about every military general or flag officer will say that your military uh, will not usually bring solutions to the table, at least not complete solutions. When we look at what's happening in Iraq, for instance, right now, even though ISIS has been blunted there, recognize that this is one line of effort amongst five lines of effort that the coalition are putting into action, right? It is certainly a very important line of action. And as we bring the Iraqi security forces to a level that they can bring pressure and put it onto ISIS, push them back out of the towns and either back across the border uh, into, uh, into Syria, where then more pressure can be brought to bear on them then, recognize the other lines of effort have to do with bolstering government institutions in Iraq, right? Which really was a large part of the problem in the first place. Another line of effort is tracking down the finances for ISIS, not a military activity, but an extremely, extremely important line. Until you scrub that one out, ISIS will continue to be able to purchase weaponry from all kinds of sources. Also combating ISIS ideology. Why does that ideology 
resonate with young people not only in the region but in our own country here. We have the director of CSIS here helping with that very problem. But it's these lines of effort together that may in the future actually drive us to a solution. In the meantime, we're proud to have the effect we're having. It will be very rare in any of the complex scenarios we're faced with today that the military will provide the complete solution and we would never be those who would agree or be putting forth that we will provide that. As we talk about uh, our men and women in uniform and the fact that the number one priority for any chief of defense, for all of our leaders, for every one of our soldiers, sailors, and aviator is to be ready when the call comes, we recognize that the popularity that comes from that also puts us in the public eye in a way that Canadians feel very compassionate towards their men and women in uniform. You'll remember a, a, a narrative that came out about a year and a half ago at Christmas uh, that we had a, a, an epidemic with suicides. Um, I didn't want to disabuse Canadians of uh, the sense that we had a problem with suicide because there is no good news in a suicide or a group of suicides. The fact is our suicide numbers have been about consistent between, be, sorry, between 10 and 20 over the last couple of decades. And interestingly, very few of those suicides are tied to operational duties. Now, be careful. We do have post-traumatic stress disorder tied to those challenges that we place our men and women in that may, in many cases override their senses, uh, their civil senses from society. And we've gotten much better at preparing them, building mind calluses, if you will, on top of the muscles that we're putting on them, road to mental readiness. And when they hit something in theater, we've gotten much better at debriefing them. We bring them back to their families, not immediately out of theater, but we take them through a third site where they can decompress, and we talk about reintegrating into their families. Meanwhile, we go back to the families and say, you're finding, you will find someone who's slightly changed by their experience, perhaps someone who loves you deeply and will be coming back and will be the father or the mother that you sent off at some time, but maybe a little bit different as a result of this. Be patient and we'll work together. We've gotten much, much better at that. But that PTSD and those mental health issues, which we do have and are working with, are important and we're improving in our abilities to get people to come forward and say, I got an issue, I got a problem, can you help me? We can, when they put their hands up early and we get them through our, our ability, our address, our, our uh, medical protocols, we're find them, finding them to be more and more effective. There's a lot of research going on internationally, but in Canada, through SIMVER, if you would have heard of it, the Center for uh, Mental Health, uh, Veterans uh, Mental Health Research, 40 universities deep into research that are opening up fields and uh, protocols that we had no idea about. Interestingly, the suicide issue that Canadians are so concerned about, we find that most of the reasons men and women in uniform are committing suicide are tied to those very reasons that Canadians in broader society are committing suicide, and that is breakups, marital breakups and family breakups, the loss of loved ones or the separation from loved ones, financial issues and substance uh, abuse and dependency. Those are what are triggering things in society. Those are what's triggering things uh, for men and women in uniform. Um, when Canadians put their arms around us, sometimes it hurts a little bit and obscures some of the good work that's going on. As CDS, when we had that spike two Christmases ago, of course I was very concerned about that spike. We were about to have a record low number of suicides this year, and it was my Surgeon General who said, I told you, don't focus on the numbers, Chief. They'll burn you because we will have suicides. We are a reflection of our society at large. Where you should be focusing, Chief, is on what we're doing for those people who put their hands up who have mental health issues, and that will be a very positive story as we continue to work on those things uh, that are um, uh, contributors to suicide. 
Uh, but you'll also see, of course, that uh, Canadians look at the Canadian Armed Forces and they expect that our men and women in uniform will be treating each other with respect. With respect, the idea of sexual misconduct happening between men and women in uniform is caustic, it's corrosive. We depend on our men and women in uniform to work very well together and to support each other. Our men and women, our women are strong. They're out there on the front lines uh, in uh, Kuwait, in Eastern Europe, out on the seas. They're everywhere our men are. Uh, NATO, although we, we're at kind of 14, 15 percent uh, of women in the Canadian Armed Forces, we're leading with that percentage amongst NATO. Trailing Australia by a little bit, but leading in NATO, and we've been recognized for that. We've got to get better. We've got the stretch goal of 25%, which we're not changing at all. We are going to continue uh, to open up uh, all of our occupations are open. Some of them have been extremely successful at getting women in. Healthcare work, uh, many of the traditional um, uh, support trades, uh, engineers, actually. Uh, but to date, we have not yet found the recipe on, in large numbers, uh, attracting uh, women into combat arms, Army, Navy, uh, or Air Force. We'll work on that. We've got to come to that. But Canadians are worried. They're concerned about a, a report that I had commissioned by uh, Madame Deschamps recently. And when she came in, I didn't ask her, hey, have we gotten better over the last 10 or 15 years? We had that data. We know we have gotten better. Our men and women have told us we're far better. The cases of abuse, the numbers of abuse, are far below anything we used to deal with 10 and 15 years ago. Didn't ask Madame Deschamps to do that for us. We asked her to come in and say, look at us now. Look at our policies, look at our training, look at how we support victims, look at, uh, uh, at, at ways that others have, have, uh, uh, have set best practices within industry, other forces, and this is what she did. She brought 10 recommendations back. In all 10, we are going to get to where she wants us to get to. In fact, we're going to not stop at those 10. Uh, I was with uh, Lieutenant General Whitecross uh, this afternoon talking about the work plan as it's developed. It's because of Canadians' trust and admiration for men and women in uniform that they care so deeply about those things that we've always cared about men and women in uniform. People have asked me that uh, as, you, as I come towards the end of my uh, uh, time up front here, Larry, uh, and towards the end of my uh, 40 years in uniform, uh, what, would, uh, what would I see as a, a fitting legacy? And um, when you ever ask anyone in uniform uh, what they would see as a fitting legacy, you'll see a, uh, a kind of goofy, wide-eyed look because they weren't thinking in that sense. But I, I think what I would say is, is this. The operational excellence that we are able to achieve on behalf of uh, the Government of Canada and Canadians around the world now, I would like to say as a result of my inspired leadership and the inspired leadership of those great generals, uh, flag officers, chief warrant officers, chief petty officers who work for me. And there's a certain amount of that. There is a lot of room for leadership in your own industries and, and mine, absolutely. That's where we're always challenged to get better, but in fact, so much of what we're doing today in 2015 is based on the excellent work that was done by chiefs of defense and the leadership cadres that were around them not five years ago, 10 and 15 years ago. 50 years ago, someone bought a Sea King. My son's flying that thing on the West Coast right now, and he's delighted with it. Now, we're also delighted that we just took delivery of six Cyclone aircraft last week in, uh, in Halifax, and bit by bit, we will say goodbye to our fantastic Sea Kings. But it's that equipment, it's those very considered platforms that were purchased by our predecessors, my predecessors, the Ray Hennos, the Paul Mansons, the John de Chastelins of the world, who I depend on, who I thank publicly whenever I get a chance. So I'm gonna say this. If there are chiefs of defense 10 years and 15 years hence who are able to develop the same sort of operational excellence when asked by our government uh, and our elected officials on behalf of uh, Canadians, both here across Canada uh, and around the world, if they're finding the same success, that will be a great legacy. The last thing I'll say to you is, and that kind of begs the question, maybe you'll ask it in question period on defense, Procurement, 
We talked a little bit, there was an announcement today, I think we talked a little bit about it, the government is going to find a way to contract an interim uh, auxiliary uh, replenishment ship uh, for our Navy as we wait for our joint supply ships, uh, joint support ships to come on board in five or six years. Um, we took, uh, as I say, delivery of the Cyclone recently. You'll remember that we just got our fifth C-17 several months ago, and we saw it in action in Nepal, and we went along with the uh, international response to help the, the poor people of Nepal after that uh, horrendous earthquake. You've seen this equipment uh, in play already. Uh, you know that there are projects and plans ahead for fighter aircraft, for all kinds of ships uh, for army vehicles, uh, and uh, our labs are arriving now. But defense procurement uh, is better looked at over your shoulder to see the successes you've achieved, because when you're in the West, when you're in democracies, when you look forward, you see a very difficult, difficult process to come up with the platforms that you're going to need on which you'll be developing that operational excellence, for good reason. Certainly the uh, operational uh, requirement is put out by the military, but then we have all kinds of companies out there who want to compete, sometimes in an existential manner, uh, for, those, uh, uh, for those contracts. We have Canadian industry that needs to be protected to a certain uh, degree, and then we have all kinds of people making sure that we followed through all of the processes. Very difficult thing to go through, but in fact it has paid off with all of the platforms that we're using now. I'll finish up by saying um, for the uh, people uh, who are here, the ambassadors and high commissioners who are here today, I'm so delighted you're here. One of the uh, great uh, benefits and joys of this job is I get to work with so many of my international colleagues, chiefs of defense, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and in every case, we recognize that it's on each other's shoulders uh, that we will be meeting many of these very complex challenges uh, as we go ahead. Uh, so uh, for you to be here in country, and the last time we spoke here at the Rideau Club, uh, there was two feet of snow on the ground. This is what you deserve for coming to Canada now, and you've got about a month of this before we see the snow on the ground again. Uh, you, uh, you really do represent your nation so well, and with your defense attaches here uh, as well, we've got a great uh, defense and security net, uh, and I thank you for being here this evening. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Uh, CG invited uh, General Lawson to speak at the Global Policy Forum series uh, because as a global policy think tank, of course, we're very interested in the global security issues. Uh, and you delivered that, but also so much more. Um, you talked broadly about how Canadians feel about their armed forces, what they expect from the armed forces, military culture. And so, yes, you touched on the geopolitical issues and, and what the forces are doing in, in the Baltic with NATO and, and how we're blunting uh, the ISIS attacks uh, and so much more. But you also addressed the difficult challenges that you've faced as CDS, uh, issues that have been in the public eye uh, regarding suicides, regarding sexual misconduct, um, and in fearlessly taking on these issues that we didn't necessarily ask you to speak about, but because you feel a sense of responsibility about them, um, you demonstrated uh, the qualities that I have noticed for 40 plus years uh, since we were in high school together, qualities of integrity, uh, decency, humanity. Uh, those are great qualities in any person, but they're especially good qualities in a leader. And so for your insights today, your remarks, and also for your leadership and your public service these many decades to Canadians in Canada, uh, we thank you once again. Thank you.